Today, we're talking about academic research basics. We will talk about some of the most important components of academic research, how to organize your research, and what you can focus on as you start out. So what is the difference between primary and secondary research? I think this is a very important question to start our discussion today. Um, so do you know what is primary, what is secondary? Primary research is observing the source of information directly. Secondary is gathering information from research that has already been conducted. So as you see in this image, we can specifically observe the behavior of squirrels, or we could read about their behavior from other researchers who were observing their behavior themselves. That is the biggest difference, and you really need to see the distinction between those. How about you? What kind of research have you conducted in the past? I assume that at this point you have conducted some secondary research already, but maybe you have also conducted primary research. Again, think about the difference. Types of sources that are used within those two styles of research. In primary research or first-hand accounts, we can include historical documents, interviews, surveys, eyewitness accounts, original work like a poem or a novel, experimental work. All of those are first-hand accounts and that would be a part of primary research. Secondary research are materials written about primary research. Here you could find interpretations and evaluations, evidence by scholars and experts in the field, and so on. So imagine you're trying to look for a good restaurant to eat, uh, a restaurant where you can eat. We're not going to eat the restaurant. Um, so you're looking for, for a good restaurant to go to, right? Um, you can personally go to a restaurant, experience it, try different dishes, and gain that knowledge. That would be your primary type of research, primary research. Or you could ask somebody else. You could ask a friend, hey, what restaurant did you go to or what restaurant would you recommend? That would be based on your friend's personal experience, right? So that is the difference, either conducting the actual research yourself or reading about other people's primary research. This leads us to the question of topic. What topic do you want to choose? Think of you know, a general um, idea, uh, a subject, but then you can separate that from a research question. You can have a very general topic, but what about that topic do you want to study? As you start your research, in addition to having a general topic, you need to determine what your actual research question is, right? So what question will your research be answering? So a research question is the uh, broad question that asks for an exploration of the central phenomenon or concept in a study, okay? So you have kind of an idea, a topic, and now you're asking a question, what are you going to explore? What will your study do? You ask questions like what or how, or what is the role of? An example that you see on your screens is the research question that I used in my doctoral dissertation, for example. My question, my research question was, what is the role of personal choice in individual language shift? So my topic was individual language shift, but what specifically about it would I want to study, right? So I, I narrowed it down and I specifically wanted to look at or explore the role of personal choice in that uh, phenomenon of individual language shift. Research question is very important, but how do you determine what your research question should be? I would say the first point, it should be interesting. You need to pick a research that is of interest to you. If you're writing a research paper for a course, if you have that choice, 
pick a topic and then narrow down to a specific question that you really want to learn about. It would be a very uh, boring semester uh, if you if you picked a, a topic that you don't really care about. Um, so, so pick something that is of interest to you. Very, very important. Next is meaningful or having personal significance. Um, it definitely helps if the topic that you select, if the research question based on that topic that you select has a special meaning to you, maybe a personal significance. It could be something connected to uh, your previous experiences. It could be something connected to your personal interests um, or your expertise or your background, but you definitely form um, more interest in your research if you make that connection, if your topic and the research question specifically has a special meaning to you. Next point is challenging. You don't want to pick a topic that is too easy. Sometimes our lives get complicated and, and, and we want something simple, but in reality, when you start conducting research, if it is, if the answer is too simple, then you will lose that interest in your work. So think of something that will challenge you in some way so that you can look forward to learning something new, finding out new material, uh, looking forward to knowing the results of your study. Your research question has to be clear. Try to avoid additional words, try to avoid questions that are too long. You want to be very clear. Every word needs to have its proper place. You may want to revise your question multiple times to finally come to that one very clear question. Your research question should be researchable. It should be something that you can actually uh, resolve at the end. If you're asking a question, you want to be able to find an answer. We'll talk about this um, later on during this presentation. Specific is another characteristic. You, you don't want to have a research question that is too broad, too general. You want to ask something specific. The topic could be broad, but the question needs to make it specific. You can try to offer hypotheses or speculation about answers. And that is usually a part of your research as well. You try to answer your question before you conduct the actual research and then see, is this an obvious answer or uh, could this possibly be different? And then of course it is always fascinating to see if, if your own research follows what you expected. Sometimes we find things that are very unexpected. Sometimes we realize that we did something wrong or our expectations were wrong. So you know, you, you don't necessarily have to have the same uh, response to your question as what you have provided in your hypothesis. So non-researchable question. I mentioned it uh, a few minutes ago. What is a non-researchable question? So I want you to think about it for a minute. All right, so here are a few points. Uh, there could be others, but these are some of the um, significant you know, ideas that could help you find or eliminate that non-researchable question. Data is unavailable. You're asking a question that you cannot answer. You do not have the data. Maybe you don't have access to that data, or maybe the data simply doesn't exist. So as you ask, as you formulate your research question, you have to see, will I be able to find data to answer my question? Next one, obvious answer, or only one reasonable answer is possible. That means that your question is non-researchable. If it is something that you can quickly Google online and get a very specific answer, it is not worth conducting research the whole semester to find out that exact same answer. So if, if there's an obvious answer, if there's only one reasonable answer, the question is really non-researchable. Value-based responses. What does that mean? That means that 
the answer depends on your or somebody else's personal preferences. You can't ask which color is prettier, blue or red. That depends on your personal preference. Um, the same could be about food or uh, travel destinations. Um, and, and you can take that further to uh, more scientific ideas as well, but you really have to distinguish, is this really an answer you can come to or does this merely depend on personal preference, value-based judgments, right? Cannot test a hypothesis. So if you have a question and you have a possible response, but you can't test it, you can't find out what it is, then you have to, um, you can't conduct the research. You cannot find out the answer. So if you can't test your hypothesis, it is not researchable. You need to figure out how to adjust your question so that it becomes researchable. When you conduct research, you need to have a plan. You need to plan it out. You can't just start this very moment. You have to plan things out. Just like if you're writing an essay, you need to prepare an outline, provide a plan so that you know what you're writing about. When you conduct research, you have to keep in mind so many different components. How will you conduct your research? Where will you find your information? What type of research will you have? And then plan it out. Do you have a specific timeline? If you have a deadline for a project, then how would you plan out your time so that you're not stuck two days before it is due trying to complete the whole research? You need a certain amount of time to prepare your survey, for example. Then you need an amount of time to administer that survey, to send it out to your participants so they can respond and get back to you. Then you need some amount of time to analyze it. Then you, so so um, again, you need to plan out your process. There are two components of this, and I sort of mentioned both of them. One is an outline, and two is the project planning. So an outline could be kind of a the basis of your final product, your, your research paper. You create an outline. Project planning is when you plan out how you will be um, working on that project, right? How much time you need for preliminary work, for background, gathering background information, um, conducting your survey, gathering the results, analyzing them, you know, what, how much time you need for, for all of that. So you would have a sort of a timeline. Um, if you're taking a class, then usually you would have a timeline in the form of a class schedule. So you kind of know what assignments, what readings you have throughout the semester and, and what the deadlines are. Um, if you conduct research on your own, you have to create those deadlines for yourself so that you can plan things out. Even if you don't have specific deadlines, at least you need to have uh, an order of, uh, of events that need to happen. One of the important components of research is finding additional information. So whether you're doing secondary research or the whole research is relying upon um, research that other people have conducted, or maybe you're doing primary research, you still need to learn what is already out there, what other researchers have done. So you will be using additional materials in your research, no matter what style of research you're doing. So um, as you work on your research, you need to maintain a working bibliography. So you, you maintain records of everything that you're finding and that you can potentially use in your research report. For every source that you find, you need to look for a library call number or a URL for each website. Um, you, you know, the image on your screens shows uh, several books from a library bookshelf, and they all have this call number window, right, where there's some letters and some numbers, um, and this is how we keep track of books in libraries. So this is how you can find a book. Um, 
So definitely write down the call number if you have physical books that you have checked out from the library. Um, URL of each website, keep that address available so that you can access that uh, source again at some point. For every source that you find, definitely write down the authors or editors or translators if that's applicable. Keep track of, keep records of all the titles, book, journal, chapter, article, write that down. Publication information, so date of publication, location, publisher, edition, all of those things. And page numbers, that is very important too. So if you keep a record of a, of a book and the book has 300 pages, you need to know which page you found that quote from so that you can later use it in your writing. There are different ways of maintaining a bibliography. Uh, you could have printouts and photocopies where you have you know, a physical binder maybe with a lot of materials gathered there. You can keep a notebook where you take notes. Um, most likely you will have a computer folder with a number of files. So make sure that you keep uh, your materials organized. Uh, you can even do post-it notes with some basic details. Um, you can't put as much information on a small post-it note, but you can uh, find a way of organizing your material. So definitely keep a working bibliography, all of the stuff you find recorded in some way. How do you record this information is kind of our next step, right? Um, first is, you know, you can paraphrase or summarize. You, you can have a direct quote. Um, you can um, keep separate notes. There are different styles of note keeping. Um, Brook notes is, is one of them. Work nets is another. So, and, and there are many other different styles. There are different uh, computer programs and apps that help you organize materials as well. So as you get more involved in research, you find what strategies work for you to take notes from different sources. And of course, the main point here is to avoid plagiarism and copyright issues, right? You want to make sure that if you're sharing somebody else's idea, you give credit to the author so that it doesn't look like this is your idea because it is not. And then you can get in a lot of trouble. So in the research community, you really need to make sure you give credit to people whose ideas you're using, which is fine. Don't be afraid to use other people's ideas in your writing. That's fantastic. That shows you're um, you know, a well-researched um, author, but you need to keep record and reference the authors of all of these ideas that you're sharing. As you look at your sources, you need to evaluate them. Uh, you can't just take the first item you find in the library or first item you find on your phone if you do you know, a simple search. You need to check your sources. So you want to evaluate them for reliability. Are they reliable? For credibility and authority, who's the author of this um, piece that you're reading or listening to, right? What, you know, how, how credible are they? Relevance, how relevant is this material? Context, is there um, specific context um, around a particular source? I assume you have um, experienced, you know, seeing something taken out of context in personal communication. Um, it, it is done very often in many other, you know, spheres of our lives when somebody's ideas are taking, taken out of context. So when you cite sources, when you use sources in your research, you want to make sure you check why a certain idea was expressed, who expressed it, uh, what was the context, what was going on at the time when this work was published, which year was it published, because things obviously change with time. And then finally, there's objectivity and bias. Um, I believe that most research does have a certain bias with it. It is very difficult to be objective in your research unless it is a scientific research in a lab where you know, you're just mixing ingredients together. But if you're conducting any kind of social research, for example, who is conducting you as a researcher is very important because you're looking at everything through your own eyes. So it is uh, virtually impossible to be um, an objective observer um, and objective researcher in social sciences. So um, you 
just because you have a certain background and a way of looking at things, it doesn't mean that you can no longer be a researcher because then we would have almost no research to read. Um, but you need to acknowledge your background, acknowledge um, your uh, views, your um, um, way of looking at things. And that way, as a reader, I can then see, okay, this is where you're coming from and these are your thoughts. And finally, I want to talk about the ethics of research. Confidentiality. What does that mean? It means that you will keep your research participants uh, personal information confidential. So if you're conducting an interview, you will not use real names um, of, of your participants to, to keep their lives private. If you're conducting a survey, you may have 20, 30, or 500, or 1,000 uh, participants there, but you should not use their personal identifying information there. So definitely keep your research confidential or your participants' uh, information confidential. Informed consent. You want to make sure that um, your research participants formally consent to doing that, that they were not coerced in some way, that they were not bribed or their lives depended on it, right? So uh, definitely as a part of your survey, for example, you would have to have, uh, yes, I agree to um, respond to these questions section. Minimal risk. Um, you definitely want to protect uh, your participants and uh, protection of vulnerable groups specifically is very important here. So, so there's certain ethical aspects of research that you need to keep. All right. Well, now you've learned some, some basics. Um, you can uh, start working on your own research. Consider what topic you would like to use. Um, consider, uh, consider what topic you would like to use. Think how you would narrow down your research question. Good luck.